UCL and I previously completed an internship with GCTI. Um, I'm currently working as a security consultant at a firm in London. Um, yeah. Um, for those of you who don't know GCTI, our main mission is to drive discourse, education and practices of counterterrorism globally. Um, we aim to do this through the use of research, data gathering and polling. Um, we work very we work with a variety of academic partners um, and practitioners to create world class educational curriculums um, that can be accessed globally. We recognize that the fight against terrorism is requires a multidisciplinary approach and we aim to promote a greater understanding of this topic by incorporating this multidisciplinary approach. Um, the topic of today's webinar is human trafficking and we'll be examining a range of complexities across different regions. Um, human trafficking has always been a significant issue globally and as the world develops more rapidly it is now even more important to continue this research um, to aid global practices to help us counter this issue. Um, I'll now pass over to my colleague Angela who will provide a more specific overview of the content to come in the rest of this webinar. I hope you enjoy the rest of the time. Thank you, Isi. Uh, hi, everybody. I am Angela Serrano, the prayer coordinator at the Global Counterterrorism Institute. And I'm truly delighted to welcome all of you to our webinar about human trafficking. So, okay, today our panelists will navigate the complexities of combating human trafficking in our ever-changing world, uh, we'll be discussing a range of crucial topics such as the legal challenges facing the different regions, the role of law enforcement in the prevention and prosecution, and the socioeconomical factors driving human trafficking and more. So I want to emphasize that our discussion will focus on different regions, nine specifically, that will include uh, North and South America and the Caribbean, Europe, the MENA region, Africa, Asia, and the Pacific. And for that, we have assembled expert panels that will explore uh, the challenges and solutions for each region. So I really encourage you active participation. So please feel free to share your questions using the, the chat feature and we'll address your questions in the Q&A session. And before we begin, I'd like to express my um, heartfelt gratitude to our panelists for their valuable expertise. And I also want to thank you for being here and for being part of this important conversation. So thank you very much for your attention. And I'd like to invite Mrs. Camille to take the floor and share some insights on the North American region. Thank you so much, Angela. I'm so happy to start this. All right, let me just share my screen. All right, is everyone able to see my screen? Yes. Perfect. All right. One moment. All right. So hello, everyone. My name is Camila Amberger. And today I will be discussing human trafficking in North America and the Caribbean. And uh, explicitly, I will be emphasizing more or less uh, trends and countermeasures. So here's my table of content. First, I'd like to discuss how basically the slave trade and colonialism has shaped human trafficking within the North American Caribbean region, what trafficking routes are made, and then lastly, uh, anti-trafficking strategies, limitations, and what progress can be made. So... With um, the slave trade, essentially Africans were captured and then transported to uh, South America, to the Caribbean and North America to, you know, work as slaves in order to and in order to exert control over the North American Caribbean region. This included a lot of structural and gender based violence. So this included different practices such as slavery, indentured servitude, forced family separation, genocidal policies and ethnic cleansing. So. Um, all of this has shaped different prevailing economic and political structures in North America and the Caribbean. And um, as a result, a lot of racial hierarchies were formed and then perpetuated. 
Um, other things to take in, into consideration was at the time, among a lot of indigenous communities, the ideas of othered and exoticism were um, explored. So with the idea of the other, it's linked to racism and the emphasis on the differences of certain people. And exoticism is the romanticization of the racial, ethnic, or cultural other. And a lot of these effects can still be seen today in different uh, indigenous populations. So in, in North America, um, there are some murdered missing indigenous women phenomenon. And basically this refers to the 100 deaths and disappearance of, of native women and girls every year. And um, basically on a lot of native reservations, um, as there's a lot of um, different vul vulnerabilities that take place there, whether it's government, in, you know, induced poverty, institutional racism, uh, dispossession of land and resources, um, all of these more or less heighten uh, predatory, you know, predatory behavior against indigenous women and girls as there aren't really any resources to help them fight or combat against this. Additionally, a lot of traffickers are less likely to be caught on indig indigenous land this is all due to a lot of unjust, um, legal or you know, it, you know, legal jurisdictional um, systems that take place. And in Mexico, while these um, two systems are not in effect today, they can still be seen. So please forgive my pronunciation. The ecomienda and repartimento system were both um, forced labor systems that rewarded uh, the Spanish the legal right to um, impose forced labor on indigenous communities. And so this forced a lot of uh, indigenous communities to grow uh, you know, produce cotton or cacao for the Spanish to the detriment of their own crops and receive nothing in return. And this can more or less still be seen in the state of Chiapas today. So the state of Chiapas has a high indigenous population. However, are they also have like a high, um, it's also a naturally resource abundant state. So they have things like um, oil, co uh, coffee, natural gas, and um, so on. Um, all of the wealth from these natural resources, they don't remain in the, in the state. They actually go to up north to the more wealthy states. So this leaves a lot of the indigenous communities in a state of poverty and with a lack of education, a lack of any other opportunities or a lack of or not even having a birth certificate. This um, makes them vulnerable to a lot of human trafficking situations. And in the Caribbean, um, sex tourism more or less reinforces a lot of human trafficking. So a lot of former colonies uh, during in the Caribbean, these were once like sex havens for a lot of the colonial elite. And so the Caribbean today is still very much dependent on the global North countries uh, for their main industry, which is tourism. And um, a selling point for their tourism is more or less the relationships that are very common within the Caribbean region. And since the slave trade, a lot of these relationships, especially among Africans and indigenous communities, they were very much um, hypersexualized and other, as they were very different from the relationships that were common among uh, the colonizers. So uh, consumers of the North, they are looking for exotic young women or girls. And so traffickers in the Caribbean are more or less able to fulfill those demands. And to keep in mind with trafficking routes, the overall, the most important thing to remember is that the trafficking route is always south or more or less south to north. And the reason why it's south to north is because um, a lot of the trafficked persons believe that, um, you know, the United States and the Canada, since these are very much wealthy countries in the global north, that they are more likely to have more economic opportunities there and make a better life there than in their own home country. And um, a specific route to keep in mind or a hot spot is more or less the U.S. and Mexican border. This is a huge trafficking pathway where a lot of um, trafficking happens, whether it be labor trafficking or, um, you know, labor or sexual exploitation, um, especially if it's sex tourism. Unfortunately, most of the sex tourism that happens within this region is, um, you know, with a lot of trafficked girls. And what connects, um, you know, Mexico and the U.S. and Canada together is the Interstate 5 Highway. 
this is a highway that connects um, the Mexican border to the Canadian border and runs through various popular destinations for trafficked persons, such as like Los Angeles, um, Seattle, San Francisco, and Vancouver. And then in uh, the Caribbean, the a lot of the migration flows, a lot of them also are the same as like the trafficking flows. So a lot of it is internal. So within the uh, Caribbean nation itself, extra regional. So the um, with between different islands and then outward. So from the Caribbean to, you know, outside to another neighboring nation. And the most common you know, form of exploitation within this region overall is sexual exploitation. And this takes in the form of sex tours and sex rings uh prostitution pornography and sex tourism and the most common victim it happens to be uh in north america would be uh women but then in the caribbean it would most likely be girls and then afterwards it's men and boys but when it comes to labor exploitation the most common victim there happens to be uh, men and then women and then children and it takes in the form of forced labor or bonded labor, which is also known as debt bondage. And um, with domestic servitude, it does exist within this region. There's just very little data about it, but we know it's very much common in the Caribbean and it takes in the form of a um, restavik. Uh, please forgive my pronunciation. And basically a restavik is a child that comes from a very poor family and they are sent to go live with a upper class family in the hopes of better education opportunities or um, to send money back to their families. However, once they arrive to the family, they are treated like an indentured servant. And then other forms of exploitation can take place such as forced labor or sexual exploitation. And when it comes to anti-trafficking strategies, it's really important to keep in mind that what we know of what works is very limited. So really there isn't a single approach guarding whether what you know, what strategy implemented has like an overall effectiveness. So the UN evaluation group, they have outlined um, good you know, criteria for like good program evaluation. However, the UN has also admitted that the information uh, that's gathered on human trafficking, it doesn't currently show whether counter trafficking efforts have actually reduced human trafficking. And what's important to know is that a lot of the in North America and the Caribbean, a lot of them really rely on the pure victim narrative to be in the center of their strategy. And what to recognize about the pure victim idea is that it fails to recognize the ways that tra um, trafficked women or trafficked uh, victims are both the victims and the agents in most of the times of you know of a trafficking situation and in particular the north america in north america you know the us and canada they um, rely on the three piece strategy so prevention protection and prosecution and to a certain extent mexico and can and the caribbean do focus on this but we'll get to that in a minute so what really limits any progress being made any further within this region is there really isn't a differentiation between sexual exploitation and sex work. And this can be seen going back even before uh, any legislation in North America. So in the United Nations International Convention for the Suppression of the Traffic in Persons, it does not define trafficking. However, um, it does want to curtail trafficking and prostitution, but regardless of whether, you know, the consent of the person was involved. So under this framework, the sex work, the sex work of all uh, people, more, most of the time women, was perceived as sexual exploitation and the movement of all sex workers between countries was framed as trafficking, regardless of whether the... Um, you know, women were complicit in the sex work industry and or their migration. And another thing to keep in mind is that a lot of uh, trafficking policies, especially in the US and Canada, they are linked to a lot of immigration issues. And so this starts a categorization of migrants in guilty versus innocent. With this dichotomization, this creates a, st distinct a distinction between innocent women and or innocent persons who deserve the protection of the legal system and the um, guilty persons who deserve the circumstances they might find themselves in. 
And um, what really also limits from any more progress for being made is there is a lot of misinformation on what trafficking is. And in recent years, um, the conspiracy theory platform QAnon has really been, um, you know, facilitating a lot of major false conceptions on human trafficking. So at its core, QAnon is a movement that seeks to reinforce racialized and gendered roles of feminine helplessness and more or less the protection of like a lot of traditional um institutions and so it only limits human trafficking to being only the sex industry and regard in disregards other forms of exploitation so whether it be labor organ trafficking child marriage or child soldiers and with funding um so this is kind of more or less important for the caribbean um so in order, so the Caribbean doesn't have many resources to really combat human trafficking, so they rely on help from the U.S. With that in mind, um, you know, if they don't comply, then they risk any um, funding um, being sent back to the Caribbean. And so as a result, every year, um, Caribbean countries kind of have to contort themselves to provide enough evidence, whether false or not, to prove that traffickers are you know or human trafficking is being um dealt with and especially in the way that the you know the u.s wants human trafficking to be dealt with and so this kind of more or less corrals a lot of the caribbean to adopt um the u.s human trafficking discourse um the progress that has been made though um there has been acknowledgement in particular that um, the slave trade and colonialism have um, shaped a lot of the situations for a lot of people, um, especially indigenous uh, communities or a lot of different ethnic communities, um, you know, be how and how they are trafficked. And this was acknowledged in the Trafficking Persons Report for 2023 for the United States. It's a step and it is a step. However, there is so much more that needs to be done. And I'd also like to highlight the proactive approach that the Caribbean has been taking. So they have provided a lot of anti-trafficking units and with the help of the U.S. as well as the United Nations. Um, CARICOM in 2013 have um, implemented in their crime and security strategy a, pri a prioritization towards human trafficking efforts. And then recently, since August 2023, um, with the help of United Nations Office of Drugs and Crime, they in the Caribbean there has been the Track for TIP initiative, which is essentially um, helping airport staff identify um, or you know identify trafficked persons so that they can help them. And since its inception in, in August 2023, 24 um, victims have been identified so far. So here are all of my sources. And here's my contact information if you would like to discuss this even further. Thank you so much, and thank you for allowing me to share my presentation today. Thank you, Camille. Now we are going to discuss the South American uh, region. So Clarice, you can start. Hello, let me go ahead and just share my presentation. All right, so good morning or good afternoon or good evening, depending on what time zone you are in. My name is Clarice Diaz, and I am happy to share with you the research that I've done on human trafficking in Latin America, focusing on regional challenges and solutions. And I just want to add that it's actually a great pleasure to go right after Camille because many of the facts that she cited um, in terms of migration really supports the work that I've done and the fact that migration is a huge factor in human trafficking in Latin America. So great strategy for putting me right after her. So Latin America, what exactly comprises this region? So countries in Latin America are from the North and Central America, South America, the Caribbean, and the dependencies and constituent entities. There are many, many countries, as you can see. And I wanted to highlight here, I'm not sure if you could see my cursor, 
But El Salvador and Guatemala out of the entire region have the two most extreme cases of human trafficking. And one reason for this is that they are part of Central America. So they're essentially in a bottleneck when it comes to migration. And you will see this uh, visually in my next slide. So before I go on to tier levels, I just wanted to point out. So if you look at this figure with the map of the Latin American region, you see here this very, very thin strip. So those are the countries in Central America, which include, again, El Salvador and Guatemala. So this is really a bottleneck when you have nations that come from, say, Argentina and try to migrate all the way through Mexico, eventually trying to reach the United States. So you can see on this list, I have several countries. So really 24 um, countries that have trafficking in persons report as uh, uh, created by the U.S. Department of State. And these countries are designated at different tier levels. So a tier level is essentially a designation of whether a country is meeting minimum standards to eradicate human trafficking and if they're even making attempts to do so. So the majority of Latin America are at tier level two, which means that they are indeed making an effort to eradicate, but they are still not meeting the minimum standards. And then we have three countries, Nicaragua, Venezuela, and Cuba, who are at the tier level three, which sadly means that not only are they not meeting the minimum requirements, but they're not even making an effort to do so. So Latin America, the facts. So what are the main categories of human trafficking? What makes them different? And whom exactly do traffickers target? So I want to be sure and emphasize that sexual exploitation, forced labor, which are the two main types that I'm going over, are not the only types of sexual, of, sorry, of human trafficking that they have in Latin America. But I'm just focusing on these two because these are the most prominent. So sexual exploitation is essentially an exposed activity. For example, escort services or brothels or um, sex rings. These are activities where participants or, or customers need to be lured in. Therefore, there needs to be a certain degree of advertising. Sexplo sexual exploitation is often run by organized crime groups and gangs, which makes it really difficult to eradicate because organized crime de facto rules the roost when it comes to the Latin American region. And last but not least, with sexual exploitation, you have many, many cases where establishments are owned by U.S. citizens. And these are often people with the resources and financing to perpetuate all of these activities. In contrast, you have forced labor. Victims of forced labor are very, very different because one, and this is a huge factor of why forced labor statistics are so different from sexual exploitation statistics, Victims are often isolated, so they work in homes as domestic workers, or they work in businesses or small farms or construction um, agencies. So because of this, they're not apparent to the wider community, to civilians, to people in that particular town or city, that they are in fact being used um, as forced labor. They, they are in fact victims of human trafficking. Um, another reason that forced labor victims are not as highly reported is that there's a huge language barrier that the owners of these victims take advantage of. So these owners know that because of the language barrier, you know, their, their domestic worker is not going to try and reach out to someone because they essentially don't speak the same language. And last but not least, there is also the fear of going back. And in addition to that, there is also in a, in a, essentially the inability to travel or even leave if they wanted to. So owners sometimes keep the travel documents of these victims. And these victims, more often than not, don't even want to go back because the conditions that they left are even worse than the conditions that they are living in. So whom exactly do traffickers target? Migrants, and this is a huge, huge, let's just say unique factor about the Latin American region, which I will go on further into my presentation. So migrants are kidnapped by human traffickers, or they're sold to them because they're unable to pay debts to the smugglers that they are hired to help them migrate to another country, 
or sadly they are given up by family. And this is for a family who either one, need the money that they will get in exchange for selling this individual, or two, they're deceived into thinking that their family member will leave a, live a better life. So what makes Latin America different? I hinted at these two main reasons before, but the two main factors that makes Latin America so different compared to other regions is the fact that there is so much organized crime. So the world's most dangerous crime groups are essentially housed, are based in Latin America. An example is Brazil's first capital command. And because of such high levels of organized crime, there are high levels of government corruption, increased levels of violent crimes. Um, there's also domestic violence and extreme poverty, lack of education, lack of resources such as food and energy and clothing and water. So these things all lead and funnel into why people want to migrate. And again, it is this migration, this mass migration movement that supplies the human trafficking situation in Latin America. So migration, and if you can see from the figure I have on the bottom right, essentially start in the south, for example, from Peru or Argentina, head north, wanting with the goal to eventually make it to the United States, hence the American dream. Unfortunately, because of the only option of going north is starting from south and heading that single direction, traffickers know the route. So it's very easy for them to pick off individuals and kidnap them, or they're able to pick off people who are left behind. And a lot of the trafficking activity and kidnapping of victims actually happens at these national border crossings. Now, with all these things that make Latin America so different, what exactly is being done and what needs to be improved to help mitigate to help mitigate the human trafficking situation in Latin America. So, oops, apologies, it went the wrong direction. There you go, steps taken in areas for improvement. So steps forward that the Latin America region has taken are improved legislation and policy. So there are policies that are more greatly enforced that support and aid anti-trafficking um, legislation. There is also law enforcement and prosecution, which means two things. One, law enforcement, they are better trained to handle trafficking situations and trafficking cases. And with prosecution, there are actually higher rates of prosecution for the human traffickers and the other criminals or individuals involved in this ring. Research and data collection is improving slowly but surely over time, which again will help in accuracy of creating policy. And last but not least, there has been a huge movement towards more international partnerships, such as with the United Nations or Interpol. And the main benefits of these are that these organizations have the finances and the resource to make more of an impact, but they also have the expertise. Things to improve. There are several, unfortunately, but it's still a step forward. Cross-border um, cooperation. So as I mentioned, because of all the rampant organized crime, there's so much going on within one country that the leaders of a country essentially don't want to invest the time or the resources to help something that is happening outside of their borders. So that is a huge factor because, again, human trafficking is a transnational organized crime. Next one is there needs to be greater empowering, greater empowerment of vulnerable populations. So the people who want to leave, if they are educated, if um, they have assistance finding jobs, if they're able to get help in, so that they're not in extreme poverty, these are essentially lessening the reasons for why individuals want to migrate in the first place. And last but not least, victim center of centered approaches this is a huge thing in my opinion that needs to be improved and which i want to go into further detail in my last slide so la strada international is an example of an organization that i feel really has it spot on when it comes to victim centered approaches quick history they were uh, founded as a project in 1995 by the european commission and then they were eventually turned into the organization that it is today by several NGO initiatives. And they have their 
um, base in Amsterdam. So they have four main pillars, essentially at the root of their beliefs, their dogma, and, and their goals. One is a shift of human trafficking perceptions. This is a main one. And one thing that stood out to me is them really having that shift, that paradigm shift in who exactly is a trafficking victim. So a trafficking victim can be more than just the individual being forced to work in a brothel or the individual being forced to clean someone's house. A victim is also someone who's forced to lure in other victims or someone who's forced to engage in monetary transactions between individuals and businesses. So tying onto this, is safe reporting and non-punishment. If individuals know that they're not going to be punished by reporting um, a sexual exploitation situation or forced labor situation, then they're more likely to advocate and speak out. Now, the next one Lestrada International emphasizes is training. So training in victim identification and training the authorities with victim support. So once they have victims who come either on from their own free will or through the coercion of someone else they know exactly how to deal with them not only on a legal basis but on a personal basis as well then they also um, promote cooperation so cooperation between civil society and authorities civil society between state government and even civil society between international organization and this strongly ties into advocacy leading to policy making last but not least they are also a proponent of education so creating initiative having an awareness campaign that educates the community victims themselves as well of what to do if they're put in a situation, how to identify other victims, what to do, how to report, and most importantly for the victims, how to get them to integrate and adjust back into society once they're taken out of a human trafficking situation. So I feel like with all of this information, hopefully this will be taken into consideration in terms of ways to improve and what to implement to help mitigate the human trafficking situation in Latin America. So I would like to end my presentation with a quote from La Strada International, essentially outlining what their goal is and what they want is for people everywhere to be able to work and migrate of their own free will without fear of expectation and granted rights in their home countries abroad and in transit. Thank you very much for listening to my presentation. I hope you found the information very interesting. And at the bottom is my contact information if you ever want to discuss anything. And I hope you all have a wonderful day. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Clarice, for your amazing presentation. Uh, my name is Anastasia, and today I'm going to talk about human trafficking in the European region. So here is the outline for today. And I would like to start with some data collection challenges, because there is a huge lack of reliable data, and it's not only a problem in the European region. And part of the reason is that governments regard such data as classified information and are not ready to share it with others. Moreover, lots of the victims are actually scared to report about their situation for various reasons. Some of them are the threats from the traffickers, for example, or fear of the penalty from the government if they are undocumented migrants. Uh, another problem is the incentives with which law enforcement officers tackle this, uh, meaning that there is a lack of proper mechanism to convict traffickers, and because of that, the authorities sometimes rather choose not to go after them. What is more, in the case of the EU, it is hard to find reports with proper data on each state individually, because this information is gathered during a couple of years and only then published collectively. Another thing which I spotted that actually you rather prefer to focus attention on the actions and funds to find human trafficking rather than giving some in-depth data. Uh, Moving on to the types of human trafficking. So according still to this limited data I managed to found, which you can see on the slide, as according to the Eurostart, stra starting from 2008, uh, sexual trafficking remains the main form of exploitation in Europe, comprising around 55.7% in 2021. 
Uh, so it should be also mentioned that the percentage is actually smaller than it was in previous years. And this can be explained by the rising number of victims of forced labor that comprised 28.5% uh, in 2021. Organ removal uh, is another major purpose for human trafficking in this region. Globally, UN reported that uh, people trafficked for organ removal comprises uh, around 0.2%, but in European region, it's actually around 10 so this crime is happening on a huge scale because there is a shortage of organs for transportation and some people uh, cannot stay on the waiting list for years when it's literally a life or death situation for them. And the most common organs to be removed are kidneys and more rarely parts of livers. And usual victims of this um, type of human trafficking are men around 30 years old. Uh, next, I would like to focus your attention on some local trafficking statistics. I won't go into details about each state, just we'll give some general information and talk about some of the prominent examples. So, according to the report from uh, 2019, which I managed to find, the main destination where victims of human trafficking are exploited is Western Europe, because those states are uh, doing better economically and generally performing better. Uh, the top countries for that are the UK, Germany and Italy. Uh, other countries like Spain, Austria, Sweden, uh, France, Belgium also reported as being hotspots places for exploitation. And the same report stated that the majority of victims come from the Southeast Europe, which involve in this case uh, Albania, Bosnia and Herzegovina, Bulgaria, uh, Hungary, Moldova, Montenegro, Romania, Serbia, but also Turkey. Turkey. Um, so the Eurostat statistics, which you see on the slide from 2021, highlights that generally in EU, the majority of victims, to be precise, it is 43.9% come from the reporting country, 407 from non-EU countries, and 154 from other EU states. The examples of such states uh, are Bulgaria, Romania, Poland, and uh, Croatia. Uh, now I'd like to talk a bit more about one of the hotspots of human traffickers, uh, Italy. The majority of victims are foreigners here, unlike, for example, in Germany, where the majority of victims are actually Germans. So usually victims uh, come to Italy from Brazil, PRC, Bulgaria, India, Romania, and Pakistan. Uh, COVID-19 pandemic has brought lots of changes for traffickers. Uh, specifically, the work of sex traffickers became easier and less risky, and it's not only the case for Italy, but in other states as well. Uh, that is because it uh, became harder actually to track them since they recruit people now online and use apartment rentals, not uh, as usually bars or brothels. Interestingly, that in Italy, there are also PRC and Nigerian trafficking networks who are recruiting people from their countries to be exploited in Italy. And moreover, it has also been reported that actually those networks are protected by the Italian crime syndicates. It is estimated that around 45,000 of people are victims of sex trafficking. Majority of them are women, but also around 3,000 of them are children. Uh, as for the forced labor, traffickers mostly operate in agriculture in southern Italy, but also uh, in construction and restaurants. Uh, the U.S. Department of State report mentioned that 1.5 million of unregistered workers and 3.7 million of undocumented workers today are at risk of experiencing labor exploitation. And part of the reason for that is a huge number of migrants, which comprised around 600,000 in 2022. Uh, they usually become victims of human trafficking during transportation and while also waiting for the asylum, because usually this process takes... Uh, a uh, couple of months to get the legal documents to be able to work. So at this point, people are desperate and turn to the traffickers for the help to get some job and money. And many traffickers also recruit people directly from migrant centers, pretending to be their relatives, so they uh, would gain access to their information. Uh, now, moving on to the eastern part of Europe, specifically Ukraine. Uh, which is an important case, in my opinion, to show how military conflicts can affect the human trafficking. Uh, before Russian invasion, it was reported that both foreign and domestic victims are exploited by traffickers in Ukraine, and moreover, lots of Ukrainians are exploited abroad in such countries as Russia, Germany, Poland, some other EU states, uh, but also in the Middle East, China and Kazakhstan. 
A uh, majority of victims are used for the forced labor. In Ukraine, though, the number of foreigners being exploited is not that high, and the usual spheres where forced labor is used are manufacturing, construction, agriculture, and also street bagging. Uh, the situation has changed with Russian occupation of Ukrainian territories in 2014, and the limitation for the access of international organizations and NGOs by Russia on the occupied territories created perfect conditions for the operations of human traffickers. Since 2014, lots of girls and women were reported to be kidnapped for sex and labor exploitation. Moreover, people were also forced to fight and be engaged in criminal activities such as drug trafficking. The full-scale invasion in 2022 has made the situation even worse. That is because millions of people fled the country and has become vulnerable groups for human traffickers. And the need to find accommodation and earn money for life pushes people to seek illegal jobs and fall into the trap of traffickers. Moreover, kids who were unaccompanied are facing also extremely high risk of being exploited. Lots of traffickers were already operating during the first days of war on the Polish border, offering transportation or accommodation. Moreover, the U.S. Department of State report stated that, that, there are, that there were cases already on the occupied territories when children were used by Russian forces as human shields, informants, and also soldiers. Uh, lots of children were also forcefully deported to Russia, making them vulnerable for human trafficking again. Uh, but next, I would like to focus your attention a bit more on the anti-trafficking efforts. And one of the most important documents in this regard is the Palermo Convention, which was adopted in 2000. It became the first global document that accepted definition of trafficking in persons. It has been ratified by all EU member states. However, it approached to the issue only as a crime and from a law enforcement perspective. And for that reason, Council of Europe in 2005 then adopted its own convention on action against trafficking in human beings. Uh, and this document uh, was an important shift in the understanding of human trafficking, as it applies not only to transnational, but also to domestic trafficking. Moreover, human rights became a center of this convention and demanded countries to offer protection and services for the victims. Uh, Anti-trafficking directive is also one of the main EU documents in the fight against human trafficking. Uh, importantly, is that it has a victim-centered approach and address not only persecution, but also support and prevention that has to be gender-specific. Another important document uh, is the Employee Sanctions Directive that criminalizes the demand for the labor of trafficked people. Uh, so basically, it created measures and sanctions against employers who use the work or services of illegally uh, stay in third country nationals, knowing that they are victims of human trafficking. Moreover, the Commission went further, and in 2022, they proposed to prohibit all products that were made by using child and forced labor, and not only within the EU market, but also worldwide. What is also very important and effective, in my opinion, is uh, in the measures of the EU, uh, is the monitoring of the effectiveness and adoption of the measures taken, uh, for example, by the EU tra anti-trafficking coordinator mechanism. Uh, moreover, in 2013, there was created an EU civil society platform against trafficking in human beings that gathers around 100 civilian society organizations from uh, EU, but also non-EU states. And what is more, uh, in 20, since 2011, some of the important agencies fighting human traffickers uh, officially agreed to work closer together for more effective collection of data and support of the victims. Uh, but what is also very important, in my opinion, is that in 2022, lots of initiatives were proposed to implement changes in the already existing measures because there is an understanding and acknowledgement that uh, what we have is kind of limited and we need changes because human traffickers are updating. Uh, so we need this as well. Um, so those are just some examples of the many measures that has been implemented in order to find human trafficking and was they effective or not. Uh, I don't know, because it's hard to evaluate the effectiveness around the world. For example, according to the UN report, there is a decreasing trend for victims. But in Europe, it's exactly the opposite. However, uh, I find that it actually may be a sign that in European region, countries are just more effective in identifying victims, which in turn also help to provide them with proper support and assistance. Uh, lots of financial assistance agencies were created, documents adopted, monitoring mechanisms, and they, they are all playing an important part in the fight against human trafficking. 
And all of those measures are definitely factored to some extent, in my opinion. And at least they show that countries acknowledge the seriousness and the scale of the situation. But surely there is always a place for revision of existing measures and creation of new, effective and up-to-date ones. So thank you for your attention. If you have any information, here is my contact information and also my resources. And now I am happy uh, to introduce you as the next presenter, Beshoi, who will focus on the Middle East and North Africa. Hello, everybody. Hello, everybody. Do you see my screen now? Yes. Okay. Uh, let me introduce myself. My name is Beshoi Benjamin. Uh, I have a bachelor degree in economics and political science. Today, we're going to discuss the phenomena of human trafficking in the MENA region, uh, discovering the complexities and uh, proposing countermeasures. So, Let's start by locating the MENA region. The Middle East and North Africa region is located uh, in a cross borders between Africa, Asia, and Europe, making it historically important for, for trade and immigration. However, this advantage also exposes its risk to human trafficking, uh, social and political uh, challenges, along with ongoing conflicts, make the region a hotspot for the human trafficking. So uh, here is the outline or the overview of my presentation. First of all, we started with an introduction, examined the phenomena of human trafficking in the MENA region and exploring the complexities and the unique challenges. Also, my research starts with a foundational understanding and defining the human trafficking and drawing insights from the literature. Then the study delivered into a typology specific to MENA regions, such as the Kefala system, uh, conflict induced risks, and cultural barriers. As we navigate through the data collection and challenges, uh, my research also shed light on the legislative landscape and examined its effectiveness and the gaps in anti trafficking frameworks. From concluding, we summarize our findings and offering country-specific recommendations and suggesting uh, potential future research questions. So the following is an executive summary. Uh, the scope and the aim of my research was to provide a comprehensive multidimensional evaluation of human trafficking issue at the MENA region. I targeted the experts, practitioners, and NGOs working in the transnational organized crimes in the region. Uh, the key findings that which will be explored more in this uh, presentation includes uh, the unique regional challenges like institutionalized labor exploitation, which uh, very obvious in the Gulf states uh, under the name of the Kafala system, uh, the conflict induced vulnerabilities uh, in countries like uh, Libya, uh, Palestine, and uh, other countries. Cultural barriers and significant legal and regulatory gaps will be discussed in this presentation. The data, data scarcity, uh, mainly because of uh, underreporting, uh, lack of transparency, and ongoing conflicts. Also, we discovered that there is inadequate victim identification and law enforcement capabilities. So, our recommendations. Uh, would like to develop a comprehensive framework and uh, victim reports mechanism and the standardizing legal definitions and the penalties related to human trafficking across the MENA regions uh, using the Arab uh, League and uh, other regional organizations. Also, to implement an advanced technology uh, to improve identification 
process uh, like using the biometric systems and the AI based systems. Uh, my research revolves around around three key themes. The first one is the inadequate legal frameworks and legis the legislative disparities and inconsistencies. Uh, first of all, the MENA region uh, have very inadequate legal frameworks, even if they're uh, frameworks on the paper, it's different in, in its application uh, on the reality. That's because different reasons uh, like the governmental transparency and other factors like cultural barriers. Uh, the second uh, theme is the complexity and the multifaceted nature of human trafficking. The MENA regions have various typologies of uh, human trafficking like forced labor, uh, sexual exploitation and child soldiers. Uh, the socio political landscapes affect the human trafficking phenomena greatly. Uh, the political, uh, political unrest and the societal disorders uh, affect the, the phenomena uh, and make it uh, make the regions very vulnerable to this phenomena. Also, the digital age and the governmental uh, involvement uh, is one of the uh, is one of the main recommendations uh, in our papers. Uh, also, the paper identified the gaps in the existing research. The last thing is the data gaps and the victim identification challenges. As we mentioned before, there is inadequate system for identification challenges in gathering accurate data collection which uh, make the governments uh, hard to, to to know the problem effectively also uh, the conflict and under reporting uh, have a, a great reason uh, for making things worse so our recommendations here is to push for technological solutions like ai based monitoring and the biometric systems uh, the last part uh, of my research paper was discussing that the one size fits all approach is not effective, especially in the MENA region. So we tried to tailor uh, anti trafficking measures to the unique socio political and economic context uh, for each niche. Mainly, I discussed that uh, throughout 13 uh, main uh, countries in the MENA region. Uh, like Algeria, Egypt, Bahrain, Bahrain, United Arab uh, Emirates, Israel, Lebanon, and Syria. So that was a very brief in, uh, intro to my research on the human trafficking in the MENA regions. Uh, it would be great to stay connected uh, with you or to discuss this further or to have the full version of the research paper. Thanks for your attention and now I will leave uh, you to okay to discuss the Central Africa. Good evening, all. Um, hello, good evening. Can you see my screen? Not yet. Okay, thank you so much. Um, my name is Okechiku Livingstone, aka Pharma. Um, if I continue, I want to mention that um, my connectivity is not as stable, so I'll, but I'll try to uh, see what I can do in the short time I have. So, um, I'll be discussing human trafficking in West and Central Africa, um, grassroots initiatives um, and community engagement. Um, Thank and you. Can you share again your screen? Because I'm not able to see it. So just uh, stop sharing and reshare it again. Thank you. Uh, okay, you can see my slides? Yes, I can see them now. Okay. okay. 
just a moment. Okay, so um, I was just explaining that um, um, this is the breakdown of my presentation. Um, the next slide. Now, um, human trafficking, just like in every other um, region, as uh, my colleagues have cited, um, is a very complex issue. Um, of course, which involves the recruitment, the transportation, and um, the exploitation of victims, uh, most often across international boundaries, but also within states and within regions. Uh, with that, I want to mention that um, human trafficking in West and Central Africa um, is uh, something that happens, um, uh, it's something that happens within the states and, of course, outside um, the states in the region. Um, so the region is both a sending nation, uh, is a sending uh, region and also a destination of human trafficking. Um, I want to also highlight that um, data um, over time um, indicates that there are more um, victims of human trafficking within the state, within the region, than outside the region. And of course, most of these victims who are trafficked outside the region end up in Europe and, of course, in the United States of um, America. Um, I want to also mention that um, in the region, um, uh, in Africa, the region under review um, contributes the most um, to um, human trafficking. Uh, now, um, particular focus, um, I want to mention the types of human trafficking. Uh, now, we have various types, just as my colleagues has also highlighted, but I want to mention that um, in the region, we have um, forced labor as the major um, form of um, human trafficking, um, followed by sexual exploitation and other um, forms of exploitation. Of course, um, firstly, most of um, the victims of forced labor are children, uh, um, and these um, victims they are used as um, beggars, they are used you know, um, in, to work in mines, they are used in various other deplorable um, situations. Um, then, of course, I want to also mention that um, the crime affects both male, um, adult male and female, and it also affects um, children and um, male children and female children. Um, the data we have indicates that there are more children trafficked from the region, um, and of course, more female than, than males. Now, why is um, the crime very common? There are very many prevalent sociocultural practices. Um, for instance, um, in most parts of the region, we have um, this, um, uh, this uh, would I call it, um, this system that favors more of the men than the women, and so some opportunities that, we, that should be available to women are not there. Um, this makes the women more vulnerable. Um, we have low literacy levels and lack of education, especially at the rural level. And we have economic factors such as poverty and unemployment, which also contributes um, to the push um, factors that make persons and individuals to either leave their localities and or to other countries or um, make them vulnerable to traffic cartels. Illiteracy and poor information dissemination, poor legislation, implementation of laws, um, emphasis on implementation of law because we have a couple of policies, both locally and um, nationally and regionally, um, but um, most of those policies are not um, implemented. Distrust, um, um, judicial distrust in the region, it's also a problem. Um, paramountly is also uh, the nature of the borders in um, the region. Most of the borders um, are very, very porous and they are unmanned. And so traffickers and victims are easily moved um, across the borders undetected. And of course, political um, instability, which I'll discuss more in the next slide. Now, generally, vulnerability in the region is um, it's, uh, it's the major thing that contributes to vulnerability right now in the region are uh, unstable governments and conflict environment. Um, we also we know that TOC um, cartels and groups most often exploit um, conflict zones. Uh, much more human trafficking syndicates um, because um, during conflicts, during um, violence, during uh, in, uh, in the course of 
and political instability. You see um, a lot of um, issues of poverty, a lot of hunger, and so many persons um, are very, very vulnerable to um, these crime groups, um, which makes it very, very complicated. Um, almost all the states in the in the um, region, uh, or most of the states in the region, um, we can talk of the recent military um, coups in the region in West Africa, particularly. You can talk of um, separatist agitation. You can talk about jihadism, um, the Islamic um, extremism or extremist activities that also contribute and cause conflict, and um, which of course makes. Um, the area to be very volatile and um, a better guide for um, traffic groups to thrive. Um, now, um, some community, um, sorry, it's like I missed the slide. Okay, sorry, I wanted to explain, um, bring up something from this slide. If you look at the pictures here, um, especially the one down the right, um, you discover that um, children um, are very, very vulnerable to um, the issues of human trafficking, as I noted initially. But one thing that um, caught my attention while doing the research is the fact that um, just as male children are used as child soldiers, which is a form of human trafficking, we also have um, increasingly um, girl, girl um, soldiers or female soldiers, um, girl soldiers um, being used as um, uh, being used as human trafficking um, in that respect. So um, you have girls who are um, recruited to fight in various civil conflicts um, in the region. Um, some um, community engagement strategies. Um, of course, the first thing I want to mention, uh, my colleague had mentioned the Palermo Convention, um, but of course, there are other regional um, plans and regional initiatives, such as the AU Plan of Action Against Trafficking in Vaccines, the ECOWAS Community, um, the ECOWAS Plan of Action Against Trafficking in Vaccines. Um, nationally, also, there are initiatives that have been put in place to tackle um, human trafficking uh, issues. Um, for instance, in Nigeria, we have the National Agency for Prohibition of Trafficking in Persons. In Ghana, is the Challenging Heights Initiatives. Um, these are, are involved in um, tracking um, the movement of human trafficking groups. Um, they help to rehabilitate um, victims when they are um, when they are detected. Um, they also help in the prosecution of um, um, syndicates um, that have been uh, captured. Um, and locally, also we have a lot of NGOs and, and CSOs that are involved in um, advocacy projects and. Um, activities. Now, some challenges to local and grassroots initiatives. Um, resource constraint um, is one of the major challenges these um, initiatives are facing. Um, we have limited capacity um, in terms of training, in terms of um, the ability of these um, NGOs, the ability of these CSOs, especially at the grassroots level, to be able to detect and to be able to um, go after um, the, group, um, the syndicate groups or to rescue um, victims. Um, we also have inadequate training. Um, where there is training, it's usually inadequate and it makes um, the fight against um, human trafficking locally um, to be more difficult. Sustainability, most often due to limited funding and with, um, uh, initiatives or um, programs that are drawn up to tackle the um, menace um, is not usually sustained. Um, community resistance, um, cultural stereotypes, especially um, in terms of um, women and um, children, um, some communities tend to resist um, initiatives that are aimed at tackling um, the um, crisis. Um, coordination, there is usually very little coordination between, um, for instance, CSOs and NGOs and the government or the um, CSOs and, go and um, uh, NGOs and uh, military operation. And there is also limited um, cooperation, interstate cooperation um, between groups that are fighting um, this um, crime. And of course, there is limited legislative influence. Confusion from um, our findings, we discovered that um, trafficking is an ongoing TOC with um, various degrees of impact. It affects both uh, male and female, but um, there is also an increased 
um, degree of male victims being um, trafficked and detected. Um, children, remarkably, are, um, are part of the actors, not just victims. There is an estimated 2% of um, children um, being detected as um, being complicit in the crime. Um, policy implementation and foundation is commission is a major challenge um, in tackling the crime and um, for there to be a sustainable um, tack, um, uh, for the crime to be sustainably um, tackled then um, education um, must be brought to the grassroots um, and also orientation um, people need to know that um, what it means to um, be a victim what it means to um, be vulnerable and how to detect um, uh, criminals and crime uh, group, especially at the grassroots and border um, areas. There is need for a holistic approach um, to tackle the crime. Um, a whole of government approach is needed um, to um, tackle um, the crime. These are uh, my references and um, thank you for listening um, and my contact in case you want to hear more. Thank you. I will hand over to uh, the Ram, um, he will talk um, further on this issue. Thank you. Um, thank you, Oki. And and sorry, everybody. And uh, I have little. Uh, I have an internet problem. So yeah, I'll be sharing my screen right now. And um, today, and uh, everybody, ice cream? Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. And um, today, and uh, hello, everybody. My name is Abrahim Mohamed. I'm from Somalia. I'm doing a master's degree in political science. And today, I will be talking about human trafficking in East and Southern Africa. Um, I will be I will be talking about uh, the types of human trafficking in East and Southern Africa, contributing factors, impact of human trafficking on victims and society, and also anti trafficking and current efforts. And East East and Southern Africa, it is a region possess unique challenges, and human trafficking is a serious problem that require our concentrated attention. Human trafficking is a significant concern, especially for women and children who can fall victims to traffickers. The cultural diversity of East and Southern Africa and also economic in this region create a complex environmental that traffickers exploit to find and exploit vulnerable people. In this overview, I will examine, I will examine the primary reasons why human trafficking is prevalent in East and Southern Africa and the obstacles encountered in the attempt to stop it. And I will be also and um, indulge into the dynamics, causes and consequences of human trafficking in this part of this, uh, in this part of this world. And also I will be shed on light the life's effects and the measures taken to combat it. It is a problem that requires our collective efforts and commitment to build a safer world and fairer for future for effort. These are the most popular types of human trafficking that happens in this region. Sexual exploitation, forced prostitution, individuals, mostly women and girls, are pressured to and tricked and abduct, compelled into prostitution. They endure both physical and emotional harm, all while their traffickers make money. Also, children marriage especially young girls are often forced into a marriage against their will, which is, which is a form of sexual exploitation. This case scenario, it, it is very popular in Somalia where girls are often forced into marriage against their will. Um, children, brides endure early pregnancy, violence and limited opportunities for education. Trafficking for pornography victims also, including children, are coerced and manipulated into participating in pornography. They endure severe psychological and physical trauma. The most popular type of human trafficking in, 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 in East and Southern Africa is a begging ring. It is, 
it is a it is a it is a kind of human trafficking especially um, begging rings are a distributing manifestation of human trafficking exploitation exploitating the vulnerable for financial gain addressing this issue requires a combination of legal measure social support system and public awareness to protect victims and prosecute those responsible for drug trafficking into begging ring drug trafficking while east and southern africa is not particularly threatened as a destination for drug trafficking most countries in the region are used as transit point to other destination is the most cultivated smuggled and consumed drugs in the region followed by heroin to much less extent cocaine west africa and other northern part of africa has received considerable attention as drug route as a mechanism or strength of the african region will come under treat as traffickers seek new route across the continent and uh, human traffic zone as we are aware east african countries especially somalia ethiopia and sudan it is it is it is it is it is a conflict zones recruitment of children especially in ethiopia and somalia armed groups forcibly recruit children as a combatants in conflict these children are subjected to violence and exploit and exploitation sexual violence as a weapons of what that one also happens in conflict zones especially in tigrayan region and women and girls are particularly vulnerable to sexual violence including rape and sexual slavery used as a tactic to instill fear and control factors contributing human trafficking there are so many factors contributing human trafficking in east and southern africa and uh, is fueled by a range of interconnected factors especially poverty conflict and instability educational disparities gender equality and corruption weak of of governance poverty is a widespread financial struggle make people more vulnerable to trafficking because take too risky opportunity just to survive conflict and instability especially sudan ongoing regional conflicts and political unrest create conditional where trafficking operation can thrive and taking adva uh, advantage of the weakens and unstable society educational disparities lack of access to good and an education leads to knowing about the danger of trafficking this limits job options and making people more vulnerable the deep rooted social norms and discrimination against women and girls disproportionately making them more likely to be exploited corruption and weak governance where there is a corruption within an institution it makes it easier for trafficking network to grow this makes it harder to fight against them um impact of the human trafficking on human trafficking has a devastating impact on society such as distinct groups in risk of becoming threat of becoming victims they suffer physical and psychological trauma survivors endure unimaginable physical and emotional abuse often suffering from long term health issues deprivation of freedom victims are subjected to dehumanizing dehumanizing conditions stripped of their basic rights and liberties social stigmatization are frequently stigmatized and marginalized and face discrimination making reintegration into society challenging women and girls frequently coerced into sexual exploitation they bear the brunt of this crime mainly children ruthlessly trafficked for forced labor often subjected to hazardous work condition or sexual exploitation anti trafficking efforts government international organizations and non governmental entities in east africa are vigorously combating human trafficking through a spectrum of strategies they 
as for, for example, legal framework awareness initiatives, support for victims, cross-border cooperation, and capacity development. Legal framework is strict as anti-trafficking laws and their enforcement form the backbone of these efforts. Extensive awareness campaigns educate, uh, educate communities about trafficking risk and, uh, uh, and preventions, comparative support including shelter, medical care counseling, and skill training. Empower services. Regional cooperation is a vital to tackle the transitional nature of trafficking network. The training and the resources are also provided to law and enforcement agencies to enhance investigation and prosecution. Human trafficking in East and Southern Africa is a deeply intricate and multifaceted issue that poses significant challenges to the region rooted in factors such as poverty, conflict, gender equality, and corruption. This, this perverse crime continues to exploit vulnerable population, leaving victims with a severe physical and psychological trauma. Addressing human trafficking in East and Southern Africa requires sustained and cooperation, strength, legal framework, and increased resource allocation. Only collective commitment can the region hope to combat this grave valuation of the human rights and provide a, a brighter future for its inhabitants. That was my overview of human trafficking in East and Southern Africa. Thank you for listening. Um, I want to hand over Deepak and he will be talking about the Northern South, Southeast Asia. Thank you very much. Thank you, Abdi. Uh, uh, greetings of the day, everyone. Uh, my name is Deepak Tiwari. Uh, I will be presenting uh, human trafficking issue in Northeast Asia. Uh, a quick intro. I have a master's in defense and strategic studies. I'm currently pursuing my PhD in security studies. Uh, so I'll start with uh, the uh, content of my presentation. These are the eight areas I will be covering. A uh, country-wise overview of the region, uh, trends, comparison of Northeast Asia region with uh, Middle East and North Africa region, of key vulnerabilities, the efforts, and uh, things that stands out. I'll be presenting them as uh, key findings in this region. So Northeast Asia basically have four regions, uh, Japan, uh, two major cities are Tokyo, Yokohama, Korean Island, Seoul, Busan, and uh, North Korea. Mongolia and uh, this region called Manchuria, which is basically northeast uh, China and uh, far eastern part of Russia, including Siberia. Uh, Serbia. So I'll start with the U.S. State Department trafficking report in person. Uh, according to this report, Japan uh, and uh, Mongolia are currently, and including South Korea, are currently in the uh, tier two category, uh, which means they do not meet the TVPA's uh, Trafficking Victim Person Act 2000's minimum standard, but they are uh, putting significant efforts. Uh, Japan in particular was uh, in tier one category till 2022. Uh, before 2017, again, it was in tier two category, but uh, after 2022, uh, it, was, it, it was downgraded to tier two category because of the lack of efforts in controlling and addressing the uh, growing cases of modern slavery uh, resulting from you know un unemployment during COVID-19 as stated in the report. Uh, so uh, and then North Korea, Russia and China have always been in tier 3 category means they do not mean uh, meets the minimum standards of uh, TVPA Act and uh, they are not doing anything at all to prevent trafficking incidents in their regions. So uh, the major trafficking you know, forms which are prevalent in these regions are uh, debt bondage, forced marriage, uh, commercial sex, sexual exploitation, uh, and organ trafficking. Some few cases of organ trafficking, majorly in the uh, western part of China. So uh, I'll start with uh, 
each individual country uh, country's overview on this uh, case study. Uh, Japan, as we all know, is the largest uh, destination country in this region. Uh, it's a large economy, uh, has a 24 billion worth of sex industry, 960 million value of pornography industry, uh, where there's a huge demand and the supply is being made uh, is being met by the countries from Philippines, Thailand, Myanmar, uh, North Korea, Cambodia, uh, and many others in the South Asian regions. So, uh, according to the U.S. Trafficking in Person report, uh, it says that as reported over the past five decades, uh, five years, uh, human trafficking subjects Japanese and uh, foreign men, women to forced labor, sexual trafficking, and they subject Japanese children to uh, sex trafficking. Uh, Children's, in particular, are the most vulnerable in Japan, uh, according to the U.S. Trafficking Person Report. Uh, Japan has a very dark history uh, during its imperial rule. Uh, the large criminal syndicates like Yakuza, uh, which helped the imperial government of Japan in providing comfort women uh, to imperial army uh, during World War II, uh, led to a form of social acceptance for this uh, large uh, transnational organized uh, uh, crime syndicate, Yakuza, and uh, which led them to establish a strong and well-protected supply chain for trafficking of women from Philippines, Thailand, and which have now evolved and uh, is well equipped with the technologies and you know global resources and connectivity. Uh, Korean Island, uh, there are two countries, South Korea and North Korea. North Korea, we all know, has a Kim Jong's regime, a dictatorship regime. So this region is facing the worst, the worst uh, cases of human uh, trafficking and uh, human rights violation. Uh, North Korea uh, is mainly a source country from where people, women, children are trafficked to first China and then through China because North Korea share borders with China. Uh, through China, they are trafficked to South Korea and uh, from South Korea, then they traffic to the Japan and the Western countries. So South Korea is mainly a transit hub from where uh, people are trafficked uh, to different parts of the world for uh, sexual exploitation mainly and bonded labor. Coming to Mongolia, Mongolia has a very large mining industry, which has recently grown too much because of the dependency of the uh, nearby regions uh, on the coal uh, as an energy source. Mongolia's population is 70% uh, of population is under 35. They have high risk of trafficking. Women uh, from children from Mongolia have been found in uh, Macau, Hong Kong, China, Malaysia, and South Korea involved in sex, sexual trade, and uh, you know, uh, sex, sexual slavery, uh, different forms of modern slavery as well. Manchuria, on the other hand, is a very over, uh, overlooked uh, region. Uh, they there are no specific data covering this region specifically because. Uh, uh, it's it's the it's the part of the countries China and Russia which is also not you know uh, provided proper care and governance by these uh, countries government itself so they have developmental issues economic disparity huge unemployment political persecution and different issues so and there are uh, there are issues of climate change in this region political persecution by the government and a huge uh, problem of internal migration, where people from this region are uh, migrated to the well-developed, for example, Shanghai and Moscow and other parts of these countries in the hope of getting um, employment and uh, opportunities. Uh, uh, coming to the next part of uh, my slide, uh, this is, these are the states that I uh, got from the walk free organization. Uh, it shows the uh, state of modern slavery in these countries. Uh, you can see North Korea has highest number of victims, almost 100, 105 in thousand per thousand population, uh, which shows the people are highly vulnerable and are forced by state itself into different forms of trafficking and slavery.
these are the trends that I've noticed in this region uh, according to age. Uh, as you can see, the two spikes in this graph from 9 to, se 9 to 17th of age, 18.6% uh, of people, uh, children are uh, being trafficked and uh, they are mostly trafficked into sex industries. And uh, the other category, 30 to 38, uh, they are trafficked into forced slavery. Uh, according to the uh, you know different local uh, channels and uh, uh, different uh, different NGOs in uh, working in this region, for example, Transnational Justice Working Group of uh, Korea and uh, Citizens Alliance for North Korea, uh, uh, working towards the human rights violation in North Korea, uh, among others. Uh, there's an issue of uh, you know supplying women from North Korea for uh, forced marriage and uh, organ trafficking, organ uh, you know, trafficking in China and uh, China being the source country for all the destination country for all the people trafficked from North Korea first and then to different parts of the world uh, being a huge issue right now in this entire region. And uh, recently the many efforts have been done to you know, curb the uh, trafficking incidents in Japan and Korea, but Japan and South Korea, but towards North Korea, there have not been uh, any specific, uh, you know, uh, coverage and uh, you know efforts put by international organization and the country's government itself. So North Korea is uh, becoming the largest, you know, source for all the trafficking related incidents in this region. Uh, coming to the comparison part. Uh, Northeast Asia uh, is largely, uh, you know, influenced by the pop culture of Japan and uh, South, not South Korea. So, you know, uh, the influence of uh, the pop culture, for example, you know, kawaii culture, ginkai, anime, manga culture, and the uh, largest, uh, second largest music industry of Japan. Uh, it is the main, you know, inspiration, should I say, and the, you know, influence. Uh, on trafficking related incident in this region and uh, which is not the case at all in MENA regions. In this regions, the main region, uh, the main uh, source of contribution towards trafficking related incidents are, uh, you know, the country's construction industry, uh, energy industry and tourism. Uh, and these all industries are being served, served by uh, the sex industry uh, for which women are being trafficked from entire, you know, uh, countries of uh, this Middle East, including Bangladesh, uh, some of the countries of uh, South Asia, uh, specifically countries having large Muslim pop population. For example, uh, a big number of people have been trafficked to uh, Saudi Arabia and the, uh, you know, nearby regions uh, from Indonesia, Indonesia being the largest Muslim country in the world. So there is a, you know, uh, ethnic and uh, religious uh, connotation attached to this uh, uh, this region, which makes it very different. Uh, we can compare these stats, the number of people trafficked in this region, but, you know, the main influence of trafficking in these regions are very different. So this, this is uh, my compar comparative understanding of these two regions. Coming to the vulnerabilities. Uh, developmental and non-cooperative governments uh, have been always been the main issue in all the countries uh, which you know, fuel the issues of trafficking and you know, all the incidents of trafficking. Uh, now, in this region, in this case, uh, Japan and South Korea, they don't have too much of the developmental and uh, non-cooperative government issue. The issues of this type comes from the South Asian countries, from where the a majority of people are being trafficked to the destination country like Japan and South Korea. Again, the lack of opportunity and unemployment in this region. Uh, for example, uh, there is a program called uh, Technical Intern Training Program in Japan. And according to 2017 states, there are 200,000 interns are uh, right now working in Japan in extremely harsh working conditions. They are exploited. They are given large sums of loans by, you know, illegal loan agencies, and then they are uh, they are forced to work for large number of hours and they're not paid well. Uh, the people, uh, the students, and you know, people looking for opportunities are coming from mainly China, 
largely then Vietnam, then Philippines, then uh, Indonesia, Thailand, and the, some of the uh, regions of uh, some of the countries of South Asia, like India and uh, Pakistan and you know Bangladesh as well. Ethnic and cultural discrimination has all, uh, has been a big issue in Japan specifically. Uh, people in Japan have uh, this, uh, they they discriminate with people from you know Thailand, uh, Korea, and uh, Philippines, Myanmar, Cambodia, and they do not uh, provide them equal opportunities. They treat them you know inferior, and uh, this has been a big issue. Uh, which led them, uh, these people coming from these countries, they only have choices to go into, you know, tourism industry where they are exploited, then they are forced into sexual uh, slavery and different forms of modern slavery. Uh, again, the culture and society of Japan, uh, as, you know, depicted by the Japanese culture that we see in movies and, uh, you know, manga, anime, you know, different pop culture uh, themes, uh, Japanese society is very male do dominated society and uh, women are not, you know, provided and considered uh, to be given the equal opportunities and opportunities in uh, more of the, you know, technical and uh, manufacturing industry, uh, which is the big, uh, you know, industry employment in Japan. That is one region where uh, women are often, you know, finally get uh, employment opportunity in uh, different forms of slavery and uh, trafficking. Now, coming to the efforts in uh, these regions, uh, I have uh, you know, divided the efforts into distinct criteria. So first is the strengthening uh, legal structure around the different forms of trafficking in person in these countries, specifically Japan and uh, South Korea and Mongolia as well. And the second one is creating awareness program. So, for example, uh, Japan has started a huge efforts in uh, from different through different uh, NGOs in creating awareness among women coming from different countries uh, to let them know that uh, there are uh, rules and regulations which help them uh, help them uh, you know work safely and not get into these trafficking related incidents. Uh, the interministerial uh, Liaison Committee, for example, in Japan uh, was established in April 2004, and uh, it has like five years different uh, plans to eradicate uh, trafficking in person and exploitation. So it has been working uh, very good. Uh, there are uh, very good results. It's also been highlighted by the US uh, Trafficking in Person report. Uh, there are amendments of uh, different kind in immigration and control and refugee recognition acts in these countries. Uh, amendments to the penal code in accordance with the UN Convention on Transnational Organized Crime, uh, specific use of words and you know uh, using the words in the criminal penal code and different forms of uh, you know trafficking as prescribed by UN agencies. Uh, there are public awareness campaign uh, since 2002, for example, Japan has uh, invested around $95 million giving to different NGOs. Uh, Mongolia also had started a very you know, novel kind of uh, task force called Multidisciplinary Task Force, specifically dedicated to trafficking-related incidents. Uh, under this task force, they have also, uh, with the help of different uh, non-governmental organizations, started the uh, initiative to provide awareness to uh, you know, people, for example, there's an there's this uh, initiative called Green Umbrella, uh, where they go to schools and teach the people, teach the students to you know to about their rights and how they can you know understand they are being trafficked and how not to. For example, in Mongolia, it's been a case that 96 percent of women are being trafficked to different parts of the uh, countries of former uh, former Soviet Union. Uh, on the, on the you know they are luring them on the false job uh, opportunities scams, and uh, this has been the major issue in Mongolia as well, uh, in uh, sorry South Korea as well. So uh, there is a number of awareness program. Mongolia started uh, uh, this green umbrella initiative. Uh, then Korea also have a very strong uh, recently amended criminal acts. 
uh, Article 288, 89, 92 for kidnapping, trading, and purchasing in women and children and foreign nationals. Uh, thankfully, they have included specific words, definitions now, which was not there earlier and was used as a loophole uh, for these criminal syndicates. Uh, Child Welfare Act, Juvenile Protection Act, Juvenile Sex Protection Act, Prevention of Prostitution Act are some of the major and uh, recent acts which have been passed by the Korean government. Uh, there is a biennial meeting between government and members of uh, Japan Network Against Trafficking in Person, uh, which is the largest uh, you know, uh, organization which is working in close cooperation with governments of uh, Japan, South Korea. Uh, they have started a platform uh, where they try to identify the issue and then develop action plans to address these gaps. Uh, while law enforcement is cracking down on these uh, perpetrators of uh, trafficking, uh, NPO such as uh, uh, Joey Japan uh, focuses on you know raising awareness among parents and children. So uh, they have uh, you know they are putting much efforts through non-governmental agencies. And uh, what I personally feel is they are not like uh, trying to bring these criminal syndicates like Yakuza under justice, not cracking down on the traffickers, but uh, more focusing on, you know, uh, satisfying their international pressure and uh, maintaining their image uh, because they are recently, you know, targeted to, they are being targeted to uh, tier two category and uh, they are being called on different national platforms uh, because of the rising cases of uh, trafficking. Uh, now, my findings are like, uh, which is like specific things which uh, stands out in this region. For example, uh, women are being trafficked from Thailand and Thailand and Philippines to Japan and South Korea because of their uh, English speaking skills. So these women are, you know, forced into sexual sex industry, uh, and then they are served to the uh, Western, you know, tourists, you know, which comes comes there to you know, enjoy these, you know, culture of Japan and, you know, the pop culture and all. So this has been a pretty interesting thing. Criminal syndicates uh, like Yakuza and others, they have a very strong understanding of immigration rules and regulation in Japan and South Korea. And uh, they exploit these rules, uh, you know, to regulate their operations. And they have a strong supply chain, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, again, there are legal uh, loan syndicates, as I mentioned, uh, they provide. So what happens is uh, people from all these countries, as I mentioned, North Korea, Thailand, Myanmar, they come to Japan in hope of gaining uh, opportunities in tourism and all. And uh, they are provided loans by these uh, illegal loan syndicates and uh, to gain the citizenship and get good, good opportunities. And then uh, through the, you know, this loan, they like uh, they are they are forced into this uh, form of slavery called bonded uh, debt bondage, where they are uh, to pay their uh, loan. They are forced into sexual slavery mainly, and uh, modern slavery, different forms of modern slavery. You know, like uh, working long long hours under abusive boss in different uh, manufacturing industries and working in homes for cleaning services and all. Uh, effect of COVID. Uh, now, this has been an uh, interesting uh, you know, thing about this region. Uh, during the COVID, there were bans, you know, lockdowns. So there was a sharp decline in uh, traffic incidents. But what happened after the uh, raising bans and uh, lockdowns, what happened is that there was a huge unemployment uh, because many people lost their job. And also there was a huge uh, rise in tourism industries because after getting, you know, locked down in their home, people started going out, uh, you know, in large number. There was a huge influx of tourists into uh, Thailand. For example, in 2021, they, they hit the all time high number of tourists, Japan as well, South Korea as well. And this surge in tourism created a demand in these uh, countries. So again, these unemployed people, they, they were forced to go into these regions to find the opportunities in tourism sector. And then later they were forced into slavery and sexual exploitations. These are my uh, sources. Uh, thank you all. Uh, 
I'll end my presentation with a quotation from uh, Mahatma Gandhi, uh, being presenting this, uh, you know, participating in this presentation from the birth city of Mahatma Gandhi. Uh, he said, uh, "Nonviolence is the summit of bravery." Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, I would like to invite Siddharth. Uh, he'll present uh, human trafficking issue in South Asia. Thank you, everyone. Hello, everyone. Am I audible? Yes. Yes, you are. Is my screen visible? Yes. Okay, then. So, hi, everyone. My name is Siddharth. And yes, Deepak, that was a very great presentation. And uh, a short intro I have completed my master's in defense and strategic studies. And today I am going to present trafficking in person, um, trafficking in basically South Asia region. So let's start. So these are my content, which I am going to present today. Overview, research, literature, types of trafficking, global statistics, locals, vulnerabilities, and existing anti-trafficking efforts, or we can say law protocols. So if we consider trafficking as a business, so in South Asia, it is worth around $32 billion. Most of the trafficking happens regionally because in South Asia mainly there are two types of trafficking if we divide into types, regional and international. So 99% trafficking happens regionally, only 1% is trafficking internationally. So and the causes are mainly population as South Asia has one of the largest populated country in India. So population conflicts in South Asia, law enforcement is not as good as it should be. Then conflicts also, as we can see in Afghanistan, political instability and economic uncertainty, such as Pakistan and Sri Lanka. So for the research purpose, I have largely rely on uh, UN, UN or DC report global report on trafficking which publish every two years a u.s department of department reports of trafficking in person and the Warfare foundation report of global slavery index so types of trafficking so in south asia mainly two types of trafficking are very prevalent one is folk one is folk labor and other is sex trafficking so or we can also say that trafficking for a sexual purpose so Every year, around one and one lakh fifty thousand people are trafficked, in which forty four percent are women and twenty one percent are girls. And those who trafficked, fifty six percent are victims of the forced labor, thirty seven percent are sexual exploitation. As I mentioned earlier, ninety nine percent trafficked domestic, domestically. A South Asian Pacific whole. Uh, is the third most vulnerable region due to you know, there is a two biggest populated country plus lack of quality quality life economic opportunities and other things apart in india mainly 8 million people reportedly victim of trafficking in pakistan four point this number is 4.5 million people with Afghanistan has the highest vulnerability in the region due to largely conflict. So let's move on. So these are the statistics which I have extracted from the UNODC reports. Uh, this as they have, as you can see, 11% decrease has been reported when we compare recent data to 2019. Uh, we can also say this, this is largely due to COVID-19 and this is global picture, not the regional. As you can see further, 21% decrease in reporting in cross-border. Also, we can say there was a lockdown, so this. Then 24% drop in sexual exploitation and other form of 15% female traffic victim detector minus 11. But interestingly, male victims were increase we can see that the three percent 
increase reported in male victims and one common thing which have been reported overall in every region that conviction rate is decreasing globally there is 27% now when we come to region we can also see there is a high conviction rate in south asia so these are the regional statistics as you can see 6% decrease has been reported compared to 2019 81% cross border trafficking did decreasing reported so as covid 19 has huge impact on this trafficking because majority trafficking is happens within the region now again the domestic trafficking when we say domestic it is within the country also so there is also decreasing in 23% we can see 12% decrease in female victims has been reported then we can also say see 31% victims uh 31% decrease has been reported in victims which were tra trafficked for the purpose of sexual exploitation and 67% in other forms but 3% increase has been reported for the male victims and 58% increase has been reported for forced labor again child victim detector also even so we can also say this is largely due to the covid-19 and that uh, lockdown things and everything see the conviction rate which has decreased 56% so what it shows that in south asia law enforcement agency are are not working very properly or it, it is very weak so when you cannot connect the people who are trafficking they have no fear for trafficking so these are the my challenges for collection of the data see local data so whatever this data we have, i have shown it is only registered interestingly in south asia majority of are the cases are never registered so we this data only gives us half picture now again lack of qualitative data as i mentioned there is no reporting happening so it is clear clear, clear that we can not have proper qualitative data even that we have data there is no specifications like there is no classifications we can say like such a which group which a particular uh, like male and for which purpose there is no classification in the data also now quantitative data has been provided limited as i i said that there is no classification plus there is very limited research happened on this region particularly for the traffic this trafficking purpose also there is no centralized mechanism such as in eu 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 is there for european union but in south asia there is no such a mechanism all also there is a shark but there is no you know centralized collected data system for the trafficking purpose in whole south asia region and comparison with uh, international data or national with national data is very much impossible largely due to they are not you know like they are not on the same page when it comes to the definition of the trafficking so as of 2023 bhutan was not a part of it like uh, palermo protocol they have accepted uh, ratified recently so the vulnerabilities of the region one of the see politic political instability then economic opportunities migrate uh, then we can also say conflicts and this all the primary cause and if we go into details discriminatory social norms such as uh, in some countries caste based discrimination is very much prevalent so which force people of that group particularly to migrant other countries for econo economic opportunity and other things also so to avoid that exploitation and everything which so these people becomes like vulnerable for the trafficker groups and i can we can say in nepal it is very much prevalent india is very in india very much prevalent when we say in bangladesh bangladesh primary cause is gender based violence plus child marriage as child marriage as as it is very much uh, prevalent in bangladesh so the, their women their youngers are like you know young women migrate from there so they can not officially migrate so what they do they find alternative ways and which makes them vulnerable so now 
I have mentioned conflict and seven percent originated. It simply means in globally, if you find the victims of the victims of trafficking due to conflict, seven percent originated particularly from South Asia and mainly Afghanistan. So Afghanistan is the primary. We can say lot of people were are vulnerable in Afghanistan. Primarily women, former defense uh, personnel of Afghanistan army. children because see there is no there is very lack of opportunity economic opportunities plus they have also imposed some restriction on women and girls they have banned their education and everything so this group wants to migrate for the bet better opportunities which makes them vulnerable all and child marriages are also there so we can say economic crisis such as sri lanka we have seen in recently which forced people to migrate now in sri lanka economic crisis is there people want to go out but if they follow the legal process then it it is time consuming and plus it also involves much money <coughs> pardon so same as they also look for the alternatives which makes them vulnerable also in sri lanka we can say minority are also the vulnerable group same with the pakistan also in pakistan there has been no land reform still it's independent independence so as we, i have mentioned earlier 4.5 million people are you know victims of bonded labor it is very much prevalent in there and the majority people are from sindh baluch as pakistan only punjab is developed state other state are not very developed so these people migrated from seen then baluchistan to punjab side and which makes them very vulnerable even or additionally their minorities face like you know abduction and conversion and lot of things so this their minority of pakistan are also vulnerable group of people and when it comes to the indian context as i have mentioned migration from poor states so what is happening in india is there are some states which are very developed and there are some states which are not very developed so what is happening is people from very less developed states migrants from their state to rich state and there there is a you know people who exploit these people largely for forced labor although there is a sexual exploitation but primary is forced labor here ab and apart from these people also tribal people such as from state like chatisgarh and their children as they are uneducated they are also the vulnerable people group of people in the india so the, what are the laws of protocol currently which are existing so one is palermo protocol which U united nation general assembly has adopted in 2000 came into force in 2003 which have largely three protocols one is the one provides definition of the human trafficking what they consider as human trafficking which kind of activities another one is smuggling of the migrants it deals with the smuggling of the migrants and a, a third one was like a third one is like small arms and manu illegal smuggling of small arms and manufacturing so it is not relevant here but other two are very much relevant here in domestic legislation we can say every country in the south asia has ratified the palermo protocol most recently bhutan has ratified also in 2023 february this year apart from that there are domestic legislation also introduced by the respective countries such as india has also introduced a uh, criminal law act in 2013 in 2018 they again introduced again trafficking of person law apart from that they have also like child trafficking laws <coughs> pardon bonded labor laws and everything there are such as that kind of laws bangladesh then india has bilateral agreement with the bangladesh to our combat this trafficking activity as their their border is very porous so they cannot you know surveillance everything so they have create a mechanism also sarc india has also adopted sarc convention which was happened during after the palermo protocol 
so what i can say is in domestic legislations every country have done its efforts after 2010 they have introduced law regarding or counter trafficking trafficking activities so what i can say is unless there is no conviction rate is you know like conviction if there will be no conviction there we cannot de- deal with the trafficking human trafficking so we cannot decrease we can in near time we cannot see decrease in the trafficking activity uh, so thank you these are my references and thank you everyone and i will now maria will present the next thank you sitarth Hello everyone. My name is Maria Rusu and today I'm going to hold a presentation on human trafficking in Southeast Asia and the Pacific. The content of my presentation uh I will talk about some notable trends in the region first and then I will talk about push factors in Southeast Asia and the Pacific. In the second half of my presentation I'm going to delve deeper into human trafficking in Southeast Asia and the Pacific. Notable trends in the region. The pandemic has changed the face of human trafficking in Southeast Asia. Besides the prevalent forms of sex and labor trafficking there's a scourge in online scams throughout Southeast Asia. These are massive industrial scale criminal operations that pose a global security threat and which are known as the big scams of the century. They take place most often in special economic zones throughout Southeast Asia. Most notable ones are the Golden Triangle in Laos and the port city of Sihanoukville in Cambodia. These are these scams cyber scam operations are run by chinese criminal syndicates most oftenly and with epicenters in myanmar cambodia laos and the philippines traffickers target moderately educated to highly educated victims in southeast asia the profile of the detected victims is also changing the share of male vi- male victims in all forms of trafficking is increasing During the pandemic sex trafficking has moved more underground to hotels private apartments outside urban areas and when organized criminal networks with tra- territorial control engage in human trafficking they traffic more victims more violently for longer time and for further distances notable trends in the pacific Due to significant foreign investment and complex supply chains, forced labor has become the most prevalent form of human trafficking in the region. There's also growing transnational organized crime in the Pacific. And the fact that human trafficking is not criminalized in all parts of the Pacific represents a major setback in anti-trafficking efforts throughout the region. and it's also significant that human trafficking is the largest transnational crime knowledge gap in the pacific the number of detected victims during the pandemic in low and medium countries decreased which points to weak law enforcement in these countries next we are going to talk about push factors in southeast asia and the pacific some common push factors in southeast asia and the pacific are poverty unemployment porous borders migration corruption weak law enforcement in southeast asia there's military conflict lax regulations in special economic zones industrialization and globalization in the pacific there's climate change there's for an investment mentioned earlier and comply supply chains harmful cultural practices traditional views on women and children gender inequality and gender based violence next we'll delve deeper into human trafficking in southeast asia 
The prevalent forms of trafficking in Southeast Asia are cyber scam, sex trafficking, and forced labor. The driving factors are poverty, conflict, migration, corruption, weak criminal justice systems, and globalization. Uh, first, I will start with a brief, brief outline of, of the human trafficking situation in Thailand. There's significant labor trafficking in commercial fishing sectors first and foremost, but also in the poultry industry, manufacturing, garment, agriculture, domestic work, and street begging. Victims for, from Thailand, other, other Southeast Asian countries, Sri Lanka, Russia, Uzbekistan, and some African countries are exploited in labor and sex trafficking in Thailand. In Thailand, there's also endemic corruption and complicity of police, government officials, and immigration officials, which has led to the fact that human trafficking, uh, 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 that Thailand has become the transit country for human trafficking in special economic zones and cyber schemes in neighboring countries. Next, we'll move to Myanmar. The February 2021 military coup destabilized the country by deposing the democratically elected government. This led to conflict between the military and the pro-democracy People Defense Force Group and ethnic art organization. As a consequence, 1.4 million people were displaced who are at risk of sex and labor trafficking. The military and ethnic armed organizations use child soldiers, and the military also uses children and adults for forced labor. Finally, years of violence and ethnic conflict in Rakhine State continues to drive the out-migration of Rohingya, many of whom are at high, ri high risk of sex and labor trafficking, especially those who travel to other countries for economic migration. And lastly, we are going to finish with Laos. Laos uh, is known for, first of all, for the Golden Triangle Special Economic Zone, uh, which is known for human trafficking and labor exploitation in, in cyber scam operations. And in 2022, workers from more than 20 countries accused employers in the Golden Triangle sheds uh, of human trafficking. There's online gambling, internet, cryptocurrency, and telephone scams, primarily in casinos and commercial compounds in Laos, including in special economic zones, and there's punishment for poor performance and disobedience. These include, but are not limited to physical abuse, wage, docking, debt, bondage, and traffickers may resell those who cannot meet sales quotas or repay recruitment debts to other criminal networks for forced labor in similar fraud schemes, domestic servitude, or sex trafficking. Now we'll move to human trafficking in the Pacific. As mentioned earlier, the prevalent form of human trafficking in the Pacific is forced labor, but there's also significant sexual exploitation and domestic servitude. The most affected sectors are lodging, fishing, and construction. I will first start with Papua New Guinea, uh, who is a transit, which is a transit country for sex for uh, human trafficking, particularly in the fishery industries. <clears throat> Well, there's also significant uh, sex and labor trafficking in domestic service, the tourist sector, manu manual labor, forced begging, and street vending. And uh, immediate family or tribe members reportedly exploit children in sex trafficking or forced labor. And some parents may also force children to beg or sell goods on the street, and some may sell or force their daughters into marriages or child sex trafficking to settle debts and other disputes or support their families. There's often involved a bright price or chattel, which compels the woman to remain in abusive or servile marriages. And lastly, we'll finish with Australia and New Zealand. There's significant forced labor in 
Australia's agriculture, cleaning, construction, hospitality, tourism, and domestic service sectors. There is significant sexual, sexual exploitation in both legal and illegal commercial sex establishments, motels, massage parlors, and private, private residences. There, allegedly, there are some foreign diplomats that exploit domestic workers in forced labor in Australia. And according to reports, there are, the, there are a dozen Australian education providers that provide South Korean women with false, false student visas to work in commercial sex industry, which increases their vulnerability to sex trafficking. And finally, I will finish with New Zealand. Uh, there's significant forced labor in New Zealand, New Zealand's agricultural, diary, construction, hospitality, transport, and domestic service sectors. The Prostitution Reform Act of New Zealand, New, New Zealand decriminalized commercial sex for New Zealand residents, which offers some support for these workers. But traffickers continue to target the population, vulnerable populations such as children, migrants, and adults, and they threaten migrants with deportation. And lastly, these are the uh, the reports and the articles that uh, informed my research. Thank you for your attention. Um, we now have a guest speaker, um, so I'm going to introduce him. Um, Ryan Stover is an eight-year law enforcement veteran in Arizona. He has served in special investigative units focusing on human trafficking, gangs, intelligence, organized crime, and weapons trafficking. He obtained his, master his undergraduate degree from Arizona State University in public policy, um, concentrating in emergency management and homeland security. He has also spent time in Israel training with the IDF on counterterrorism and intelligence analysis. He received his master's from ASU as well as in as well in global security and was part of GCTI's inaugural class obtaining a diploma in international security studies. Ryan has certificates from both Harvard and Georgetown University in religious conflict studies and terrorism specifically. Ryan has worked in several federal agencies to combat sex trafficking in Arizona, especially during large events such as the Super Bowl and PGA tournaments. Um, so handing over to you, Ryan, I hope you will enjoy his presentation. All right, thank you for that. Uh, first off, I just want to say a phenomenal job to the interns and the uh, cohorts. Uh, these presentations, you guys clearly did a ton of research and you guys showed a, a true comprehensive understanding of a very complex and intricate global issue. Uh, when discussing human trafficking, it has to be from a global perspective uh, because as you know, we've all now seen and heard through your guys' presentations, uh, it affects every corner of the globe. And oftentimes we get tunnel vision when we look at these issues and we look at how it affects us from where we are geographically. Uh, for example, um, like you heard on in Arizona. And so a lot of the human trafficking discussion uh, that we have is, is focused on that southern border with Mexico. And that's not the full problem. That is that is a part of the problem. And to understand the problem, we have to look at the big picture. And the big picture is the entire globe. Um, in law enforcement, we do the same thing. We look at it through you know cities or states. And again, that is a, a very small fraction of the problem. So I just wanted to start off by saying, great job, I'm truly impressed, uh, but I'm not surprised the, the level of detail that you guys put into it, just given my, my experiences with GCTI in the past. So I don't have anything to necessarily share as far as my screen. What I have is some background 
and some questions I wanted to pose to all of you. Um, anyone can answer them. Just going to be a brief discussion on on everything that you guys have said and kind of taking it forward. And then I will pass it back to um, Issy, I think, for, for the closing um, remarks. So listening to every single one of your presentations, there were a lot of uh, similarities that I heard, um, most of it being transnational. You know, this, this problem transcends borders. And so I think the biggest takeaway that I hope you all got from listening to each other's presentations was uh, cross-sector collaboration. Uh, this has to come from law enforcement, both on the state, uh, the federal, the local levels, um, NGOs, non-governmental organizations, nonprofits, 501c3s. Um, it's got to come from justice level organizations, judges, prosecutors, and people that are going to be looking at, at going after the people perpetrating this crime. Um, it's much too big of a problem to be handled between one entity or even a couple entities. And an example I have is from uh, Operation Blue Wave, which is is now declassified. You guys can look at it um, on the internet. And Operation Blue Wave was a joint operation that was conducted here in Arizona prior to and leading up to the Super Bowl. So we, we hosted the Super Bowl uh, for any American football fans last year, um, technically this year, but for the last NFL season. Um, and unfortunately, with the Super Bowl, and as we're seeing now with many large uh, popular events, with the Super Bowl comes a massive increase in sex trafficking. Um, the Super Bowl itself attracts people from all over the world. A lot of these people have money, and for whatever reason, um, the sex trafficking follows the Super Bowl. And so looking at this from just a state perspective, a state effort to counter sex trafficking, um, a form of human trafficking. We had 10 different local law enforcement agencies. We had three federal agencies. We had the FBI, the HSI, which is uh, Department of Homeland Security and the United States Marshal Service. We had four different intelligence centers or fusion centers. Uh, we had five different non-governmental organizations, 501c3s, hospitals, um, we had state law enforcement, and we had three separate government agencies, uh, Department of Child Service, Arizona Attorney General's Office, and the Arizona Counterterrorism Information Center. So in total, we had about 24 different entities operating um, during Operation Blue Wave. And that, again, is just at a state level. So if we want to take that concept and, and use that as a sample to um, look at this problem globally, uh, that's your solution. This this problem has to be addressed from, you know, a multidisciplinary approach. And 24 agencies, just to handle it at the state level, we can see how we've, we're looking at such a monumental problem. You know, 24 agencies just to handle this at a state level, what is it going to take as far as uh, collaboration to handle this at a global level? Um, so that'll be one of the things I want your guys' opinions about. Um, I guess my first question for, for the interns or the cohorts or anyone, um, what are the most effective strategies for cross-sector collaboration and how can these partnerships be strengthened to improve outcomes? So if I may add, um, I feel like two really simple things, simple but complicated and applicable to not just the situation, but really are clear lines of communication and transparency with, I guess, roles, um, allocation of duties, hierarchy when it comes to sort of the, the management line. Um, I think it, when it comes to collaborations, if there isn't, if, if there isn't that understanding amongst all groups involved, then that can cause uh, clashes and not only in understanding or potentially getting, um, you know, lines of information crossed, but just cause the whole collaboration to be inefficient with trying to deal with human, human resource type 
issues versus the human trafficking issue at hand. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's a that's a great answer. Um, and then just some more background to kind of add to, uh, to that question. When we did Operation Blue Wave, um, we did it in sections. So we started with education, or we we kind of inundated the the high risk areas with with outreach and education, and then we started the enforcement aspect. But we we targeted the people perpetuating the human trafficking and sex trafficking. So we truly did this from a victim centered approach, and I know a lot of you guys touched on that. Um, in your presentations, but going back to the question, how does cross collaboration work? What can we do better? Me working for law enforcement, when we take a female out of sex trafficking, when, when, um, you know, her, whoever's she's working for gets arrested or we, or we offer her resources and she actually accepts them. Um, that's where we're going to have to have that, those partnerships because law enforcement, we, we don't have the budget or the the resources necessary to give these uh, you know, sex workers, get them out of that life and support them till they're on their feet. I mean, that takes NGOs, that takes 501c3s. We, we're talking about hotels, food, clothes, um, medicine, um, job skill training. And, and that's where the partnerships are key. You know, we can do what we do as law enforcement and, and, try to get them out of that life. But then if they do accept that, that help, we got we to pass them along to someone who's better suited to make sure that we are truly giving them the best opportunities to succeed in life. We had to partner with judges and lawyers to make sure that when we're going after the, the buyers or that the people controlling these, these sex businesses, mm -hmm. that they're going to be prosecuted and, and held accountable. And so yeah, collaboration is key and, and not one single entity has one, the budget or two, the ability to truly tackle this program, um, tackle this problem from, you know, an, an all hands approach. So I, I think that's a, a very good answer to the question. Uh, my second question, I know um, some of you guys started talking about technology and statistics and how we can use that to kind of leverage um, our fight against human trafficking. So how can technology and, and data analytics be leveraged to identify trafficking networks, trafficking victims, and disrupt trafficking operations? And then part two, what, what ethical considerations should guide the use of technology to, to uh, look at those problems? I have an answer again. I promise I won't <laughs> leave this time. Apologies for that. My my Wi-Fi just completely disconnected. Um, so in terms of technology, I think there's, let's say, a more high-tech and expensive way and a still technologically savvy but an inexpensive way to do it. And one is, for example, using AI to, say, follow a particular algorithm to look at all law enforcement databases, um, whether they're in the same city or the same region or, or within the same continent to, to essentially, you know, compile information to try and, and locate particular trafficking networks, especially if a trafficking network isn't based in just one country. Um, and another one could be facial recognition to find perpetrators, assuming that they have a criminal record and you know, hence finding the, the victims themselves or depending on the data that they have, um, using it for victims um, and using also biometrics when it comes to sort of border crossing and it's sort of um, a non, let's just say, financially heavy way to use technology is just by using manpower to essentially scour the internet to um, monitor social media and monitor other platforms uh, for suspicious activity. And can, again, you use programs to red flag um, different sites or emails that have keywords that are sort of used in human trafficking lingo. And then, um, yeah, so those are two ways, but an, a huge ethical 
sort of contingent, particularly when it comes to identifying victims, are essentially uh, data protection and privacy. Because um, more often than not, you can't get a victim's consent to use their data if you're trying to use that data to find them in the first place. And then a huge one is also to make sure that victims' data aren't used or aren't exploited for, for example, research purposes or for statistics. And it's just really to make sure that um, their data still maintains their ability to have that you know, right to human dignity. Yeah, no, I agree. We have to make sure that um, we're not re-victimizing victims by using their information, their data, their stories without, you know, one, their consent, and two, without understanding, you know, the full story behind uh, that. And that kind of leads me into my third question. Anyone can answer this one. Um, when it comes to human and sex trafficking, um, and I come, again, from a law enforcement background, so a lot of my metaphors are going to be law enforcement related, but when it comes to human and sex trafficking specifically, it's very um, unique as far as our victim typology. So I think anyone in this um, Zoom meeting right now probably has more so roughly an equal percent probability, God forbid, of becoming a victim of, of most other crimes. You know, anyone can be walking down the street and get pickpocketed, their purse snatched, anyone's car can get broken into. Um, Certain factors affect that. Is your vehicle locked? Where do you live? Um, but at the end of the day, we all kind of have this roughly equal percentage of being victimized on, on those types of crimes. When it comes to human trafficking and sex trafficking, um, my experience is specifically uh, the victims are all, they, they all have very similar characteristics. In fact, you can, you can, look at victims specifically in sex trafficking and without a doubt, almost every single one of them falls into certain categories. Um, so we can safely say with statistics that looking at these factors that make someone more likely to be a victim of sex trafficking um, and kind of work backwards from there. And, and these factors that I'm talking about are, um, they start very young. So, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll say women, because that is mostly who we see, um, at least in Arizona, as far as just being victims of sex trafficking, but this is by no means um, specific to them. But, you know, growing up in a household where, you know, it's, it's not very stable, you know, maybe there's drug use with the parents, maybe there's early sexual abuse with um, the, the victims, maybe uh, drug use with the victims themselves. Um, mom and dad might not be together mom and dad might might have criminal lifestyles. And what we see is these um, women as they're growing up, they they get enticed by, um, again, I'll say typically males, it um, doesn't have to be male, but, but typically what we see is, is these male figures come in and they fill these voids um, in these uh, future victims' lives. And, you know, that's one of the biggest factors is, is when they come from, very chaotic and unstable upbringings and households and, and somebody comes along and offers them an escape and money and opportunity. Um, it's hard to turn down. And as soon as they accept that they're, they're in a lifestyle and it's incredibly difficult to get them out because their only sense of security and I'll use the term success, but that's, there's probably a better word for it. But they're in their, world, their only opportunities have been with this, um, you know, sex uh, suspect, uh, we'll say. And so addressing the root causes, you know, that's crucial for long term prevention. So how can how can we affect um, how can organizations come together and create these comprehensive evidence-based programs that target the socioeconomic factors, um, driving the vulnerability, the trafficking, and especially in, in marginalized communities. I guess that would be the, uh, the, the question there. Anyone can answer. I'm, uh, we can have multiple people answer. We can have everyone answer. So whoever wants to uh, unmute first, go ahead. For sure, I, I think you should go first. Um, there's actually a certain aspect of your question I want to explore further, if that's all right with you, Ryan. 
Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we'll let uh, Bashoy answer and then we can and circle back to you. Actually, I have uh, some answers to your questions, starting with the cross-sector collaboration strategies. I think I will talk about, about the MENA regions and what we really need uh, to do uh, to maintain the cross-sector collaboration uh, in the MENA regions. First of all, all the training and capacity building uh, as shared training sessions between law enforcement, NGOs, and government agencies can build common understanding and operational procedures. This enhances the capacity to deal with the human trafficking cases more efficiently. Secondly, the coordinated operations, uh, as law enforcement can collaborate with NGOs uh, on joint operations to rescue victims and arrest traffickers. Uh, lastly, the public awareness. The NGOs and the governmental bodies can collaborate on public campaigns to raise awareness about the risks of human trafficking. Especially, uh, we have very problem with the cultural barriers uh, that prevent uh, the people uh, to have awareness about issues like human trafficking. Uh, so how to strengthen this partnership? I think we need uh, to do a performance metrics to implement a shared set of performance metrics can enable more objective assessment of the efficiency of trafficking initiatives, anti-trafficking initiatives. Uh, also, standard operating procedures between the uh, sectors can be more efficiently as NGOs and uh, governmental agencies can create and share uh, decision-making informations. Uh, the second question is about uh, the technology and the data analytics. Uh, analytics. Uh, in my research, I focused on the social media monitoring as a machine learning uh, algorithm that can scan social media platforms for signs of recruitment or advertising of trafficking victims. Also, the blockchain technology, it can securely and transparently track supply chains to ensure they are free from forced labors. Uh, lastly, the geo-tracking, uh, the location-based data can help in tracking victims and traffickers. Uh, but uh, we have ethical considerations like the data privacy and uh, algorithmic bias, like it shouldn't uh, perpetuate societal biases, particularly against the marginalized communities. Uh, that was uh, my answer to, the, to your previous questions. Um, Absolutely. Great job. Great answers. Um, I like how you talked about capability building and that's important, often underlooked aspect when we when we yeah. ask for this like international cooperation. Do all of the partners have the capabilities to combat human trafficking? And if they don't, well, that's on us if we're pushing this um, collaboration efforts to make sure that we support them, whether it be economically or um, if they don't have the certain uh, institutions within their government, um, education, educating their law enforcement, their, their um, any, any type of NGOs they may have. So I like that you brought that up. I think that is a uh, good aspect and often underlooked. Um, Camille, you said you, you had uh, yeah. something yeah. to say. Um, actually, I kind of have a question for you. So how can governments work to create like comprehensive programs that target socioeconomic factors when they themselves won't address certain socioeconomic mm -hmm. factors that they have created for marginalized communities? So I'm going to be kind of talking a little bit more about like in the context of like Native Americans in the United States and relating back to the murdered missing indigenous women phenomenon. So personally, I do believe that governments and a lot of, um, you know, organizations, especially um, grassroots indigenous organizations can combat human, tra human, tra human trafficking effectively. However, they need to allow indigenous groups to have more autonomy and to be considered more of a legitimate actor and have the self-determination. So I'm pretty sure you're well aware of the history between Native Americans and the US government. Um, you know, there's always just been a very much a power imbalance between the two. And, um, you know, all of it going back all the way to the Trail of Tears, where all, all the Native American, well, the Cherokee Nation mostly was forced to relocate. And then afterwards, as repayment, 
the U.S. government, um, they basically said that they would be like the caretaker for all these different indigenous communities through the trust doc doctrine. And with this in mind, I mean, that promise has never really been fulfilled. So, for example, a lot of tribes today, they're not even able to own or manage lands um, due to this doctrine. Or since they're unable to manage these lands, on a lot of them, they're not even able to like afford their mortgage assets or loans, and they can't even make any economic development. It's so difficult to achieve. And all everything, if they even want to try to start their own business, it has to be reviewed and authorized by the U.S. government. So with all in even all the you know reservations, they have all these natural resources that they even amount to like nearly 1.5 trillion. But with all the heavy regulation that comes with the U.S. government, the vast majority of these, you know, resources, they become underdeveloped. Like, and it's not even in, like, not just in the U.S. also, in Canada, they have a lot of the similar, you know, rules and regulations. Um, Native Americans, like, the majority, or, like, there's many of them who can't really even afford a car. So then hitchhiking becomes an option. So with this in mind, um, the only way for them is to travel, like, so many, dis you know, vast distances, either to see family or to go work or seek, you know, go to school, medical treatment, whatever. But with this factor in mind, we have to look at this through the murdered, missing Indigenous women in, you know, from non lens, especially when, you know, we can look at this through the Highway of Tears. Like um, the Highway of Tears, for those who don't know, it's basically like a section of a um interstate trap you know a um yeah interstate trafficking route called um highway 16 in canada and in this section of that is where a lot of um missing you know a lot of indigenous women they go missing they're either murdered they're either trafficked there for you know different purposes like there have been reports of indigenous women getting like job offers or like you know a chance for better economic improvement and to in order for that to happen, you know, they're, they have to go off the reservation and hitchhike and, you know, there's a potential for them to be trafficked and then exploited. And this doesn't even have to be like placed in a historical context either. Like um, in my presentation, I mentioned the interjurisdictional issues, um, some of which they're not even going back to colonization. One of them is from 1978 and it doesn't even allow like, you know, native, you know, native tribes to have any authority to like criminally prosecute any non-native offenses on their own land. And so because of this, Native American women in general, they are, you know, according to the U.S. State Department, they're more 10 times more likely to, um, you know, be, you know, murdered. Or in 2016, there was a study by the National Institute of Justice where more than half of the Native women were sexually assaulted, including over like two-thirds who have been raped during their lifetime. So that's more than like nearly 2.5 times the rates for white women. And the study also found that the majority, two thirds of which um, were white, you know, were whites, all, all of the offenders were non-native of origin. So yeah, that's just kind of like my question for you is just, you know, how can governments really address any socioeconomic factors when they themselves won't just even address what is already in place? Sorry, that was a little long. No, you're fine. Uh, very passionate about this topic. I like it. Um, so let me, before I dive into that question, where, if you don't mind me asking, and you don't need to give specifics, just mm -hmm. say this, where, where are you located at? Uh, right now, I'm actually located in Germany, but I'm also American, and I'm from like New York and California. Okay, perfect. Yeah. So New York, New York has, um, especially upstate, they have tribal mm -hmm. reservations. So yes. like I said, I'm in Arizona. Um, the city that I work for, law enforcement wise, actually borders um, one of the largest reservations. Um, so I, I know reservation politics as far as what it's local to me. Um, so to answer your question, I think tribal policies differ. They differ interstate, they differ between tribes, they differ be between states, they differ between regions. Um, I can't speak to uh, your 
research and, and experiences within, you know, the East Coast and, my, and tribal policies, maybe in New York. Um, as far as here in Arizona, um, they're all considered sovereign nations. So me being a police officer, I, I would not be able to go down onto a reservation and make an arrest unless I was with a tribal police officer. So they operate almost entirely independently. The only people that have jurisdiction um, is the FBI and tribal police, um, as well as BIA, which is the Bureau of Indian Affairs. So they're very under police. Um, a lot of the uh, issues that we see in, in our reservations here in Arizona is the fact that the, the, the cartels, the drug cartels, uh, permeate the, the uh, reservations because they know that they're under staffed as far as law enforcement wise. Um, and it contributes to a significant amount of crime and, and disruption. So I, I don't, going back to your question, how do we, how do we address socioeconomic things at, at a government level when we don't acknowledge um, the past? Um, I don't know if acknowledging the past is... is I, it's not necessarily the past that really should be focused on. Well, I agree, the past really shouldn't be focused on. But I mean, there's already things that could be done now or there's just even levels of bureaucracy that could just be taken away. And to a certain extent, I'm not saying it would fix everything because there's just so many layers of complexity to this issue that, you know, would at least address some of the vulnerability factors that are already there. Like, uh, I'm yeah, saying with like things like natural resources. Yeah, sorry, go on. No, you're fine. Um, increasing... Um, public programs, education standards. Um, unfortunately, and like I said, I can only speak for the, the reservations that I've, I've worked with uh, mm -hmm. personally. Um, they, they're very independent. So um, the, the, the tribal political situation is, is a group of elders that, that vote on things. Um, obviously the US government does have some level of authority over them, but as far as the inner workings, um, I think it needs to be uh, addressed first within the community, uh, you know, increasing education, increasing outreach, increasing um, quality of life, increasing, you know, economic opportunity. These are the, the, the first steps that, that can be taken to uh, alleviate those socioeconomic situations. Um, I think the U.S. government in late has done a lot to acknowledge um, the situation that we've caused. Um, we're by no means you know, done fixing the problem, but I think we've at least taken that step in addressing it. And I think now there needs to be, um, from every level, um, investments into communities to alleviate, you know, the small socioeconomic issues that do lead to the bigger ones. Um, and, and again, that starts with, I can't speak for the New York the situation, but here in Arizona, the, the tribal leaders themselves need to um, invest in these programs if they're going to continue to operate a sovereign nation and then, you know, we can come in where we are invited to or when we're asked and, and help them with, with anything else. But I think it needs to start within the community um, and, and really start with, you know, an education and outreach type approach. If that, uh, that answers your question at all. It'll be enough for now. Thank you. Okay. Perfect. Um, yes, sir. I think, um, I don't know, can I come in now, especially on the root causes also? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, okay. Um, just as um, we have, sorry, first of all, thank you for your inputs and for the question. Um, I want to talk about um, the issue of addressing root causes, um, especially marginalized spaces. Um, my work was in Central and West Africa and one of the triggers, one of the um, things that um, I noted that causes um, vulnerabilities are ongoing conflicts, um, not just ongoing conflicts, really. You have issues of poverty, you have issues of unemployment, you have issues of underemployment um, that's ongoing. So for that to be um, a sustainable um, act, act or initiative that will tackle um, the issue of human trafficking, then we have to go down, down, down to these issues. Um, we have to deal with, especially I'm talking for my own region, 
uh, which I believe um, we could also use to sample opinion um, across Africa and some parts of the world. Um, poverty is a major driver. Um, so if we want to tackle human trafficking, then we have to create um, programs, we have to create, create projects that would um, try to create opportunities for young persons, uh, whether it's skills development, whether it's um, um, any project that will really empower individuals to um, be self reliant and to be independent. I think that's um, one. Um, illiteracy and um, lack of information is another um, deep dry, dry driver, particularly in this part of the world. Um, so we have to go to the grassroots. Not really, um, most of what we do, most of what I see, especially in this part of the world, it's um, that information and education, information and education uh, most often ends at the metropolis, at the city, at the urban centers, but way down to, for instance, the border areas, way down to the marginal spaces, you discover that um, there are no schools, and where there are schools, you find it difficult mm -hmm. to have teachers. Okay, so we need to um, get down to such spaces and, of course, equip them um, with the proper information and also educate, especially the young ones. Um, then I will also suggest um, an in-depth study, something like what um, GCTI did with um, our internship of this manner. Um, we we'll need to do, um, there needs to be this governance effort amongst experts and um, researchers to conduct in-depth researches um, on ongoing vulnerabilities and how um, this can be um, uh, mitigated. Um, then also to uh, to solve this challenge, we we'll need to carry the communities ar along. Uh, we talked about collaboration at the first uh, cross sector collaboration. Um, that is very important. But as we are also um, um, advocating for um, collaboration amongst the different or between the different sectors, we also need collaboration between the sectors or the individuals manning the sectors and the various communities that um, especially are in the marginal spaces. Um, for me, that's a very great interest because um, I work um, in the border spaces here in Nigeria and um, you discover that most TOC activities that take place in those spaces, the individuals in those spaces, the borderlanders, they are um, to some extent complicit. So to also tackle it, I believe from my own experience that you need to um, engage this community um, dwellers. You need to also come up with programs and initiatives that are informed, that are data driven, and that would help to tackle some of these um, issues um, as it were. Then I want to have a little take on in terms of using information technology. Um, um, and my own perspective would be um, for my communities or for communities in West and Central Africa, there is a need to also let people know how they can use some of these tools. There should be this cross sharing of information of how you can use leverage on technology to, um, especially in the community, in the rural spaces, how can how they can leverage on technologies to also um, either detect that, okay, this individual is um, a human trafficker or something um, like that. That's my own take on okay. there. Yeah, all good points. Um, it's got to start within the community. You have to create a culture of, of education and awareness, and you also have to create a culture that, you know, that type of behavior is not okay. So you kind of have to tackle two different messages when you when you're engaging the community and, and educating the the, the people. Um, that that's the very first step that should always be taken is, is education and offering uh, an alternative. You know, if if young people have no perceived future in a community where they're growing up in, um, then they're more likely to be enticed into, into human or sex trafficking. So education is key, but also what can we do to offer them, you know, a healthy alternative and a, a chance of succeeding in life. Um, that's all I have as far as questions, engagement. Thank you guys so much for having me. Um, I put my LinkedIn in the chat if you guys want to continue having uh, any conversations or just want to connect going forward. I've sent that in there for you, but thank you guys.
Um, I would like to thank our guest Ryan for taking the time to participate in our discussion today. Um, and I would also like to offer my appreciation for the work that our inter interns have done over the course of the past few weeks to make this webinar so interesting. Um, I hope that everyone who attended today found the discussions to be insightful and thought provoking. And on behalf of GCTI, thank you for attending our event and enjoy. And I hope you enjoyed the rest of your days and evenings. Um, Angela, do you have anything else to add? No, thank you very much, everyone, for being here.